Welcome to Scoreography, a podcast about the greatest sport on ice, figure skating. I am Wendy Buskey. And I am Adrian Buskey. And this time we are talking about Skate Canada 2023, the second event on the 2324 Grand Prix circuit. Otherwise known as the formal coronation of Deanna Stellato Dudek as the queen of Paris figure skating. <laughs> that's fair to say. I think that's a good lead up to it. Um, so last episode, we talked about Skate America. Uh, Skate America always kicks off the uh, the Grand Prix circuit. And it was a really exciting event um, with a couple of really, really good competitions and a couple that were a little bit weaker. When we talked about Skate America, one of the things that we did discuss was the Paris competition was kind of soft. Your big front runners from last season, your world champions, Rika Mira and Ryuichi Kihara, um, had to pull out of the event because due to of, an injury. Yeah, due to injury. So um, what that left was a kind of weaker field, but also it gave this great opening for a lot of other teams to get a chance at meddling. And what we had was several nice programs and some exciting people who came in there, but still like from a technical score way of looking at things, a not deeply competitive field. No, and really only three teams that properly showed up. And I don't mean that as a dis any disrespect to the other teams at all. There were three that were competitive and four that really weren't. Right. At Skate Canada, the field was definitely a bit deeper um, mm -hmm. because really any of the top, what, four could have won Skate America? Based no, on... not quite that much, but I, I think any one of them could have meddled. Now that I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the numbers right now in terms of the overall points. And yeah, any one of the top four could have meddled at Skate America, but the top two scores both would have won Skate America. Yeah. So the silver medalist here would have beaten anybody at Skate America. Yeah. So the story at Skate Canada in pairs is, as you said, is Diana Stellato Dudek and Maxime Deschamps. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, they that is so putting it mildly. Yes. Um, to me, that is the entire story of Skate Canada. <laughs> I mean, and that's not fair. There's plenty of other great stories from Skate Canada, but she, I mean, they, I should, God, I feel like such a jerk. She just is so shiny and fabulous. And it's just amazing what they did. I mean, Deanna is one of the most ferocious competitors oh, in yeah. skating right now. Well, did you hear like the my favorite part may have been just the ISU commentator saying she really inspires me and scares me a little. Yes. And his <laughs> or Irish, something yeah, like that. Yeah, his Irish is like, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to do the accent. I won't do do any favors. But he was, but yeah, he was like, she's like, she inspires me. She kind of scares me. She is. My response to that, good. Yes. And you, if you're competing against her, sh you should be scared. You should be. It's, and I think as we talk about this, a lot of times we try to kind of lead up to it, but I, but they are the marquee story here. Their score for their long program was astronomical. Their yes. short program had some bubbles. They yeah, were... it was still a little rough, and you could see it getting off the ice that Deanna particularly was really disappointed. Even though it was still a great skate, it put them very solidly yes. into first place without any questions. But it was a little scratchy and, and a little tight. But their free program, the vampire theme works real well um, with them. She sells the hell out of it. Every toe point, she stretches down to her fingernails. It is just gorgeous and solid and clean, too. I think she might have double foot, like two footed. There's, there's one, two footed one, one, one jump. Or, yeah, it was one of the side by sides. Yeah, the throws were perfect. Yes. Um, yeah, one of the, the side by sides. But that was such nitpicky details. Everything else was just stunning. And that score would have beaten the world champion free program from 2023. Like, I think Alex and Brandon front were second at Worlds, but they won the free program. And I think there's might have been a few tenths higher, but it would put them right there in that level amongst the very, very top in the world. And watching them here, to me, is the definitive statement of we are here for your medals. Yes. So this I mean, this is a big statement at the beginning of the season to drop a program that's this refined and this explosive. The team of Deanna and Maxime is so wonderful because she is such a savage on ice. I mean, she is ferocity defined. Maxime is softer, but so steady. The balance and the juxtaposition between those two kind of personalities really, really works with them. And it lets her be so explosive 
while Maxime is this, you know, steady center at mm -hmm. all of it. So many times when we see Ice Dance teams and Pairs teams, you can have one person who does grab so much of the attention. It's the Madison Chalk factor, right? Like right. that, like when you have that much it factor, you're going to draw eyes to you. But it's so important that a team can be balanced because we've seen lots of times where there's somebody who's really, really good and another person who's maybe just a little less skilled and that can really drag down a good te otherwise team. Yeah, very much. So. And uh, and in this particular case, like the pairing between the two of them just works so well and it is so really effective. Works. So like we were saying there, like the, the short program had a couple of rough edges. It was still easily enough to put them far ahead of everybody else. But coming off the ice, you could see that Maxine was taking it with good graces as far as like having a good sense of humor about all of it. And Deanna, she expected more of herself. And I think that woman will always expect more from herself and she will get it. It's genuinely inspiring because she very much, I mean, yes, a lot of folks might be like, you know, just enjoy the moment. And she can't because she just sees like all the places she could improve and that's what champions do. Yeah, she's a real competitor, and and so is he. It's just she wears that on her sleeve yes, in a big way. very much so. But what you saw was them come back in the free skate with all of those rough edges ironed off, and instead you got this dramatic, really, really effective interview with a vampire sequence with a lot of really cool touches, you know, that gothic element. She even turns element. him in the middle. Yes, I, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, if you like vampire stuff, it's so cool. It really, really executes that really well. It does. Um, I love it. I don't know what more to say about that program other than uh, go find it and rewatch it again because it's so, so good. Yeah, discover it somewhere on YouTube. It has to be there. It's just divine. Yeah, and I mean, look at the ISU feed if you need to, like, to dig through it. And yeah. if uh, you're in America like we are, uh, turn on your VPN, switch yourself to like Indonesia or something, and then watch the ISU <laughs> feeds because you can still see them there. It's fair. But I think the, the thing that it's kind of worth talking about, when you're this early in the season and you see some of these big explosive scores and stuff, there's a double-edged sword there, which is that one is that oftentimes... That is the international judges giving you that sign of acceptance of we really like this thing. Mm -hmm. And you expect over the season as things get more refined and more practiced and more a greater evolution, more little things get tweaked and fixed and whatever, that routines only get better as right. time goes on. However, there's always the danger of peaking early. Mm -hmm. And we saw a little bit of that. Say like last year, like it was taking like, and we talked about it in the last episode a little bit, but like a Yellum Kim who started off the season magnificently and faded as the season went on. Whereas other people like Han Lee or Jun Wan Cha, just talking about all South Korean skaters here, they've peaked late in the season and mm -hmm. really came on strong later on. So, well, and yeah. and this, I think that it's actually kind of good that they came off the ice in the short a little less than thrilled. Because now they have a target. Yeah. Instead of like you, to your point, peaking early, like two flawless programs would have been great. But now they can say like, okay, the free program still had a little tiny, tiny bubble, but the short program definitely needs some cleanup. And I think that that's a good goal. Yeah. And that keeps them hungry as opposed to, you know, resting on their laurels. Like, like we're ready. Not that I think that 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 team ever would do that. I think they are out for blood, <laughs> no pun intended, legitimately. <laughs> no, no, I didn't that's even beautiful. Think. <laughs> that's amazing. That's so thematically appropriate. I love it. I really feel like they the door is open for them because yeah. with Riku and Ryuchi having to drop out of their first Grand Prix, they cannot make the Grand Prix final. So who's the favorite now? Because after watching Skate America, Hook and Kunkel were, were good and and Trent and Leah were good, but they are not Deanna and Maxime. Like there is a different caliber of skating. So next week we're going to see the Italians who came in third and see where they're at. So they're a threat for sure. But I really feel like this was them saying like, we want this. We're hungry. We're coming. Yeah. The Italian team last season, I mean, they won bronze. They were wonderful. And they also came up as the season they did. went on and they delivered a really great program. I think to their detriment this year, they are using the same free skate as they yes. did last season. And when we saw them in challengers, it just didn't look as good. Now they could also tighten that back up and get back to form and peak later. But it was kind of unfortunate to kind of see them repeating it. Um, and so that was kind of a bummer to me. Yeah, I'm curious to see that next week. But 
you know, hoping that they do well. Yeah. Um, speaking, though, like to finish out pairs before we move on to the rest of, of Skate Canada, it was interesting to see the team that came in second, this Hungarian team, and I'm going to try their names and probably fail, and I apologize, Maria Pavlova and Alexei Svevchenko. It's close enough, I think. Okay. Um, it, if we said it wrong, we're really, really sorry. But uh, I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought they did a great job, especially in the free program, come, and they came back from fourth to second. And again, their overall score would have beaten anybody at Skate America. Not that, you know, different panels of judges serve sure. things differently. But it was very, very solid. And then the Italians, who um, Lucrezia Beccari and Matteo Guaris. Hopefully that's right. That was her first Grand Prix and she did a great job. She, I think she's fairly young. I think she's about 19. He's been around a long time. Their long program, however, to cats. Yeah. Kitty paws. Kitty paws. Thank you, Ashley Wagner for that, (laughs) (laughs) for for calling it that. It makes me so happy. I love camp, but that doesn't, I I don't know what, maybe that's, I don't know. You know, with Bakari and Gwari's, there's something a little strange about them because she's like 19 and he's like 35 and that can be a little distracting at moments, but there is some nice quality to the stuff that they're doing. Yeah. But what I think is kind of wacky is that, yeah, the kitty paws routine to cats, (laughs) she, she works hard to sell it. He looks a bit uncomfortable through a lot of it. He does. Also note, this dude is jacked. That dude's huge, (laughs) right? He's enormous. He is a big, muscular, clearly, I mean, he hoists her up and it's nothing. Like that guy's got, uh, he's, he could ho- do the entire like routine with her in the air. You can tell he's so strong, but the cat's routine doesn't really work on him. But their gala performance was really nice. It was really nice. And I did enjoy their short program. So this is their first season, I believe, skating together in the Grand Prix series. I'm here for it. Like more Paris teams, please. So, so great job. Yeah. But, and, I'll, and I'll throw in a, a, a little bit of a, of a nod to the Aussie team. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to, man, I, I don't even know how you say that many syllables. Geo to, oh my gosh, I feel like such a bad person because I can't say Hector's name. Jetopolis more. Jetopolis more. Yes. I'm try it. Anastasia and Hector put on a couple of nice programs and looked good in the, uh, the gala as well. Yeah. I mean, I've seen them before. I've noticed them before. Uh, and they're sh- fresh from juniors. Um, yeah. and I think that they have tons of potential. So, I agree. And that they're worth mentioning and noting um, going forward. We're in that mushy middle with the Paris teams right now. Like we have so few that are really competitive at a big time level that it there's just a lot of teams that are still in their their building up. So hopefully, you know, we have a couple more seasons before the Olympics, you yeah. know, including this one. And also this <laughs> is a competition where there were only eight competitive teams. Yeah. Skate America only had seven, I yeah. think. So there's not nearly as many Paris teams that are even in these. They don't have enough to fill all the Grand Prix events. It's also worth noting here. So looking at the the total scores, Stilato Dudek and Deschamps, they got 214 points. And then the second place team got 187.78. So the spread there between one and two, you know, this was a definitive win very, uh, for the Canadians. Very, so, very. Yeah, it was but, very cool. Though. But we should probably move on because the whole podcast can't be about them, even though I'd, I'd still keep talking about them if you let me. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to rein myself in and move on to the women's event. I think everybody would have expected Kaori Sakamoto to win this event. Mm-hmm. And she did. Because she's Kaori Sakamoto. <laughs> and that's all. She's, she's, the ter- she's the two-time world champion. Uh, and she came out and looked like the two-time world champion. Yes. Um, so the uh, the ISU, uh, and I, gosh, I can't remember his name offhand, but the Irish guy who who does the ISU. I feel terrible. Thing, I need to look at his name. He's wonderful. Uh, I really like his commentating. But he had mentioned several times that Kaori has talked about how in her first season as the reigning world champion, that that really set heavy on her um, and that she didn't really know how to handle the awkwardness of showing up as the reigning champion and that this season now is two time world champion that she feels much more comfortable in her skin with that. And it shows, you know, she's showing up and looking very, very confident, very put together. And also it's wonderful to see her come out and put on commanding skates and then immediately come off the ice and be as goofy as possible in the kiss and cry. I love it because her obviously much more serious coach is always (laughs) trying to get her to tone it down. 
And Cowrie ins- instead is playing to the audience and to the camera with like this total goofiness. Like she at one point she came, somebody gave her like a giant stuffed piece of sushi. And so she was pretending to eat it. And like, then, nom, 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 nom. Yeah. And then like rubbing her tummy afterwards, <laughs> like it was tasty. And she's just playing to the audience and the audience is losing their mind. And her coach has just been like, Cowrie, please, you know, <laughs> it's adorable. Yeah. By the way, his name is uh, Mark Henrity. Henrity. H a n r e t t y. Henrity. Oh, okay. Follow him on the socials. Yes, uh, Mark is great. Shout out he to is. Mark. But yeah, so I mean, Cowrie came in and you know she dropped a total two twenty six, um, twenty five points above uh, second place. It is what you expect from one Cowrie Sakamoto, and also from a two time world champion that she is going to go into a Grand Prix like event like this and be pretty dominant. But there was a lot of good competition in here. Nobody that was quite at her level. No, nobody nobody was in her level of dominance by any stretch. And I love, 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 love Cowrie. Her programs, I don't know that I'm still kind of deciding how I feel about both of them. I think I prefer the long to the short. But at the same time, I will watch that woman skate to anything. So it really is irrelevant. I think just the way she moves across the ice her her own version of artistry just appeals to me immensely so i'm always so thrilled to get to watch her but this competition her long program was so dominant like you were talking about earlier in terms of conditioning and peaking early to me this doesn't look like peaking early this looks like someone who came in ready for this season she looked calm and that's where she should be in Skate Canada, this is not the world championships and the world champion can come in and say, hi, I'm here. This is my title, but also let's all have a good time. Yeah. Like it was really, really good to see. It's difficult when you have a program as what I think of as iconic as Elastic Heart from last season. I know how much you love that one. And I it lo- is gorgeous. I love that one so much. So, you know, when you're coming in with new programs, it's always trying to figure out, like, how do you keep leveling up, right? How do you do like a chalk and baits where you go from winning world championships and then come in with the next season with even crazier, much more better intense, material? Better, yeah, better material. You know, in Cowrie's case, I agree that like the song choices and stuff are maybe I'm, I'm not as enamored with, but I'm always enamored with her skating. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've mentioned it, I think, maybe last time. I, I know because we didn't see, you know, we didn't see her at Skate America, but like the dress that she has for the free program looks incredible on her. And, you know, she just, yes. she, looks like a champion every time she steps on the ice and uh and that is so nice to see uh in second place at this one um we saw the the up-and-comer from south korea Cheon kim yeah and i thought she did an incredible job in her freeze she had some problems here and there and she um while she stayed in second like if for overall for the the competition she i think dropped to fourth um in the free program itself but regardless it was still a really strong showing overall i know her statement of this is her saying hi i want to be at the grand prix final this puts her in good position by getting silver here it's going to be a challenge there's a lot of women vying for six spots um at the final so we'll see but i i thought she you know made a, a good first step yeah i'm i'm just really impressed with her skating um with her grace on ice i like her programs I, there is a few places a little bit of shy timidness in her yeah. skating a little bit that I'd like to see her overcome, but she's still just fresh out of juniors. It's more to me that she has all of the goods to bring to the to the table, if you will, but she doesn't have the polish yet. Yeah. She's getting there. All of it is there. You can see it, but it's like the raw diamond. So yeah. I'm waiting for that moment where she's like, okay, now I'm really bringing it all. And that's why there is such a differentiation between the top scores, like because Cowrie won by a lot. So that's why. Yeah. I mean, like we said, it, there's a 26 point uh, difference there. And like you said, I mean, Cheon Kim was second in the short program, but fourth in the free skate. And so, you know, she still ended up in the silver position, but there were a couple of other really impressive skates in there. Absolutely. Um, the third place, this was a really, really refreshing surprise. So Japan had a skater uh, pull out near the last minute, and so they had to put in a replacement, which that happens a lot, you know, especially in the Grand Prix. And so they called up uh, Rina Matsuki um, to step in into this. And, and my goodness, did she ever. Oh, my gosh. I think most of the time when somebody gets subbed in, you don't really have a big expectation for them because usually they didn't get the prep time. They have to, like, scramble their schedule and they have to suddenly just 
put themselves together so that they can show up for it. But Reno, um, who has been on the circuit for a few years, but she was basically out most of last year, I think, with an injury. This is kind of like her reemergence into the international competition. And she took bronze at a Grand Prix event. And skated near flawlessly. Yeah. It was beautiful. She just exuded the most joy on ice that I've seen in a really long time in competition. I don't, it was hard to get the smile off of her face and it did not feel that it was a, a presentational smile. It was definitely like just someone who was thrilled to be there and you could feel it in her. It was just lovely. And I, I don't know that there's more to say other than that. It's just, it was beautiful skating. There's echoes of Hana Yoshida in that sense of a person who comes out with that much joy on the ice, but, but, but the vibe is yeah, totally the vibe different. Is very different. Yeah. There's a very youthful charm to, uh, to Reno um, as she comes out there. I mean, she's adorable, Yeah. Uh, but her skating was really, really impressive. Um, she did, I think she did two clean skates. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have, you know, quite the tech technical of a, of a Kaori Sakamoto or that refinement, but she was easily strong enough that she, she got third in, in both the short program and the, the free skate and really made, I think made an impression on an international audience who maybe wasn't as familiar with her. And you got to think for the Japanese Federation that when you get called up and you step up and you land on the podium mm -hmm. above other people who would have been considered far more uh, competitive at this at this competition like Rinka Watanabe right you you make a case for yourself in a big way and I think Reno really did make a case for herself at absolutely this. I adored her in fourth I thought it was interesting to see Maddie Skizis and who actually came in second in the free program mostly I think thanks to anger sheer <laughs> sheer pissed offedness I loved it in last season, we talked a lot about Maddie Skeezus because she is a skater who we really enjoy her quality, her personality, her whole vibe on ice. She had a free program last year that was garbage. Um, I, I'm not How do gonna, you feel? I'm not going to sugarcoat it because the thing is, is that I like her and I like her skating, but I was angry at her choreographers and her and her costume designers and everybody who put her in that stupid West Side Story program. <laughs> you also hate West Side Story. I also hate West Side Story, but everybody <laughs> hated that program because she consistently failed at it, which is why she ditched it at the end of the season, came back with her previous year's long program, and then delivered much better skates at Worlds and Team. So Maddie going into this one, you know, she's on home ice uh, in Canada for this, and so you always hope that it's going to be stronger. We've seen a little bit of her in the Challengers, and she was looking good. But her short program was a disaster. I wouldn't even call it as a, like I saw Jackie Wong say it well, where he was just like, it was death by a thousand cuts. It was nothing was a total. Oh, no. Until the last jump. Every jumping pass had an error. But that last double axle that she singled means no points whatsoever. And that's where the disaster happened. And it was clear with her coming off the ice of how angry she was. It wasn't a sugar coated man. I'm disappointed. Or I'm kind of faking a smile in the kiss and cry. She was pissed. That's fair. I mean, I still think that when you are considered a podium threat and you land an eighth in the in the short program, that's, that's kind of disastrous. That's um, fair. Because most of the time... I think she would agree with you. Yeah, most of that time that usually eliminates your ability to shoot for the podium. But she got a completely redemptive free program. A spectacular free program, yeah. for sure. It was terrific and it was... All of the form and fight and spirit that we want to see from Maddie Skeezus delivered in four and a half minutes. And you could tell that she went into that desperate to prove why she was there and why she deserved to be there. Absolutely. And you could also tell that her choreography has matured yes. with her, which is wonderful. As the, the commentator said about it, she went into this season wanting to express a greater maturity and to look like she was doing things that were more adult. She's 20 years old and she didn't want to look like a junior or like she was skating like junior ish programs. And so she was looking for things that were more powerful and that free skate definitely delivers that she landed in fourth as a jump from eighth, but she was second in the free skate because of just how high quality of a performance that was. Yeah. And it was really impressive, but Another person who was outrageously impressive and wow, what a glow up was Lindsay Thorngren from the U.S. 
we were watching last season, looking at the women coming up. Obviously, everything, you know, was the conversation was about Isabeau, but you had a lot of other young female skaters who were coming up in there. It was Lindsay and Audrey Shin and and Josephine Lee, who I think was really kind of splitting time with juniors mm-hmm. right then. And Lindsay has always shown so much promise, but um, but it wasn't fully realized last season. This performance is easily the best thing I've ever seen from her. Phenomenal, especially her short program. The fact that she went for, I'm going to get choreography from Sandra Bezik. I mean, you're making a statement just with that, with her caliber of choreography and her laundry list of champions that she choreographs for. There's an elite level element to that that is not not a thing. Um, so even upon hearing that she was working with Sandra Bezik was like, a, oh, this is this is interesting. And then seeing these programs from, you know, the first one from Sandra Bezik, the second from Shailen Bourne, they're so much more appropriate to who Lindsay Thorngren appears to be, Yes, which I can't say I would have known before this competition. And now it's like, oh, hello, suddenly I can see you. And before I felt like I couldn't. Right. I mean, there's sometimes where you see choreography that looks like that was bought off the shelf at the choreography oh, store, absolutely. right? Where it's like, here's just a program and somebody's just skating it. And then there's others where it feels bespoke, right? Like you can look at it and go, Ooh, I like that. this was made exactly for this person tailored to what they do best. And then they deliver something incredible. And what Lindsay did was have these couple of programs that felt like her. And for the first time we saw an identity on the ice. I thought the the note about the fact that that Sandra couture choreography yeah couture <laughs> that's good that's a good way yeah Sandra Bezik said that she created them after meeting Lindsay and noting the shy but mysterious nature that she has and personality mm-hmm. and so she crafted a program based around that enigma that is who she is that's maybe a little grandiose but I love it but it worked it absolutely worked if there's a thing that I, I look at in it, I mean, obviously technical could be increased a little bit. For um, sure. There's also, I do still want to see more emote. I want to see a little bit more of a acting performance on the ice. I feel like from that's her. the next step for her. It, it needs to be because the judges were appreciative, but also like, especially in the short program, I was genuinely confused by why her scores were as low as they were. Because I felt like she should have been scored a bit higher than she actually was. That said, if there is a place where I can definitely see where she's going to lose points and lose ground to other people, it is she kind of skates with one expression. Um, And I'm sure that that's, you know, it it just takes time to get past the point of like, okay, just she's thinking about every movement she has to make. I get it. And every skater's that to a degree. And it does take a while to get to the point where you can just be and express and act on ice. And I hope she gets there because I feel like this is such a humongous step forward for her. Now it's just polishing the diamond. Right. I do think there's a parallel between uh, Cheon Kim and Lindsay Thorngren and that yeah. both of them are shy, introverted people off the ice. And so on the ice, they haven't quite found how to flip that light switch that turns their personality outward to the rafters. But both of them turned out terrific performances. And like you said, like Lindsay's were some of my favorite from it. I also do want to asterisk something, which is that there was some judging at this event that was a bit wonky. I agree. There were places and and it's it shows up for me a lot more in the men's and in the dance. But Lindsay was the first part her short program was the first place where I was like, no, no, it deserved better than it got. And there might there's always the tough thing about. Finishing the skate, looking at the choreography box up in the corner, seeing that technical and then having after they've reviewed and revised it and, you know, and then slicing things down because of under rotations or whatever stuff that they spotted as a fan watching it at home. Those things can be difficult because we don't really get to see it in real time. (laughs) And so you can look at it and go, that was way better than what you're you're seeing there. And but what I think is more frustrating is when the scoring feels inconsistent where some people get that death by a, a thousand cuts and other people get some stuff forgiven, obviously. It's Kaori Sakamura Moto's edge change in her LUTs. And this is getting hyper specific. Um, a I FLUTs? Think, a FLUTs. But in her short program, she had a very clear change of edge right before she went into her LUTs, which, which basically 
makes it not quite a LUTs. It, and she should be get an edge call on it, which would be a deduction or just a lower score overall. And she didn't get it. But others did. So it basically it becomes that question of like who's getting the forgiveness and who's not. It's what we always talk about with under rotations. If you have a reputation for being a person that under rotates jumps, whether you do or not in the moment, every jump you did is going to get reviewed. Yeah. And it stinks. You build a reputation and therefore the reputation precedes you. And unfortunately, it also judges you in advance. Yeah. So, yeah, in this instance, I, I really think Lindsay should have been scored higher. But at the same time, Maddie Skeezus' fourth place finish was very well deserved considering, you know, the glow up that she had in the free program. Kind of going through everybody else. I mean, I don't want to spend a ton of time on the rest of the women's competition other than to say that uh, Rinka Watanabe is a skater that I really, really enjoy. And she just kind of had an unfortunate free program. I uh, do think she's improving since the first event of the season, though, from the Challenger. So I'm hopeful that it'll just keep getting better. Right. Yeah. I mean, she's a terrific skater, but yeah, it's just not quite coming together. Audrey Shin was really good in the short. I mean, she landed in fourth, but her free skate was a mess and dropped her down to ninth. Um, but still, uh, that short program was one of the nicest things I've seen from Audrey and really gives me hope for the rest of the season. And I want to just throw out one thing in here is that I learned a new skating term that I didn't know from the show, which is the waxel. Oh. I, and I, I bring this, I feel so bad for her. So Kaya Ruder from uh, Canada is a very young skater. She's very charming. Second in Canada right now. Yes. And, and she's the person I think you said while we were watching it that Maddie Skeezus is kind of looking over her shoulder at Kaya. Yes. Because Kaya does put some pressure on Maddie. In this particular instance, Kai ended up in 10th, so it really wasn't a competition there, um, and her free skate was pretty disastrous, but she had a moment in it where she did what is referred to as a waxel, and I had to look it up because the commentator mentioned <laughs> it, and so a waxel, if, if you're not a, a aware of it, it's basically, it's an axle that goes awry, it's, it gets out of whack, I call it a wacky axle. Um, um, that's where it came from. Yeah. yeah. And so basically what happens is that a person goes in so specifically an axle thing, they go into the axle and they're jumping forward and they're jumping forward and their body just loses the entire sense of what it means to jump in the air. And skaters describe it as a feeling like they're going to land on their head. It's a little bit like the twisties in gymnastics. And when a waxel happens, it's really scary to watch as a fan from home because they often land on their back or their chest. It's the weirdest jump because they don't even get their feet down. They just No, plummet. it's just a, essentially a flop. I felt horrible for Kaya because her face when she stood up looked shocked, mortified, scared. My first instinct was, oh my God, are you okay? She was, thankfully, and it was not her best day. But she came back, I will say, she. we just watched uh, the, the, gala. the gala, and her program it was great. She landed everything. She had a more technical gala than I think anybody else. Mm -hmm. She just made a point, like, hey, I know not my best showing, but I'm in Canada, so I'm going to show up here. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, not for nothing, I googled Waxel, and I found a few examples, and every person who has a Waxel has that same face when they come up Ugh. from it. They have so that same upsetting. utterly startled, no idea how it happened. It's just a fluke thing that happens. They basically said every competitive skater goes, oh, God, we've been there. It's just a thing that happens. Yeah. And it's so weird. But but it was a thing I learned. I had never encountered yeah. that before. So, yeah. Before we move on, there's the one other person I want to mention is Star Andrews, just because I was so happy to see her have two, maybe not perfectly clean, but pretty solid programs after having another heart surgery this oh summer. God, so, yeah. what a like, unbelievable what a fucking inspiration, inspirational person she is. But uh, yeah, it was nice to see her and see her getting back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like her long program a lot. I, I really like her short. I think her short is good. I, I don't like the music as much for whatever mm. reason. But um, and there's something about the outfit for the the short that I think is a little wonky. I just it's <laughs> it, I mean, it's got the shoulder points and stuff on it. It's very it's, 80s. I it's dig. It's cool. But I for whatever reason, I don't like it as much. But it looked really strong. And especially like, I mean. To come back to competitive athletic events after having heart surgery, like not that long ago, that's crazy to me. It's so impressive. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it was very nice to see her there. Not the, where she would have liked to have landed, I'm sure, but she still put on two great and amazing. things. Yeah, yeah, it was great. 
So dance. How about some dance? This is another one where I don't think anybody's very surprised to see Piper <laughs> no. Gillis and Paul Poirier land at the top. I'm going to be a little controversial here. Do it. So get ready. I don't love the free skate, and I think they were overscored. And I say this as somebody who likes Piper and Paul a lot, but I think that their free skate score was really generous. The Wuthering Heights program is very, very good. It really showcases what an excellent team they are. But you don't think it should have scored as high as it did? I don't think it should have scored as high as it is. And also, I just I don't, I just don't like it at that for that much. And, that's, and that is totally a, fair. You yeah. can have, it is fair to have opinions. I thought it was lovely. I mean, obviously, they were the class of the field in terms of like their flow and their edge work. And they're beautiful skaters. Oh, yeah. They're gorgeous, gorgeous skaters. And I adore them. But I agree with you. I don't love it maybe as much as a lot of others did. I don't dislike it, I think, as much as you. Their short program was really highly scored. The rhythm dance was, this is my controversial opinion, probably. It was gorgeous. They did an amazing job and they absolutely deserve to win and get big scores. But I thought it was overscored. And also just on a very personal level, they're Piper Gillis and Paul Poirier. I wanted more camp. I was counting on them to give me 80s camp and they didn't. I mean, her outfit did. Her outfit was great. But it, it, it was. But I was just hoping. For something like more big and bold and bombastic from the 80s from them. And Addicted to Love was sort of like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, I, yeah, you, you'd think if anybody was made to deliver yes. for the 80s rhythm dance uh, that's required this season, that it would be Piper and Paul. Again, it's it, great. It's very good. It's super solid. And they have... In both programs, they have moves where I'm just like awed by it. Oh, incredible. Yeah. And absolutely made their statement of, I mean, Worlds are in Canada. They're in Montreal this year. It is going to be very, very tight between them and Chalk and Bates. And it may flip their way, especially with it being on Canadian soil. Like it's going to give them that extra motivation to really want to deliver the absolute best they ever have. Like, I totally get it. And it is going to be very, very tight between them. But if I'm just looking at the material and not anything else, Chalk and Bates' material is far more my speed this season. Whereas last year, I kind of liked Piper and Paul's more. It flips back and forth, and I think it probably will until the Olympics, unless, you know, Guillaume and Gabby come back. (laughs) And it's like, womp, womp. Yeah. (laughs) Well, we'll pretend that's not on the table because nobody nobody wants to even chance that because, (laughs) uh, you know, that would upset everything in a massive way. But this was one of those instances, and especially through this whole competition, where there were places where Piper and Paul did not get called on things. Um, they did not get little things. Little, I mean, little things, but ice dance is a game of inches. Yes. And so you see some teams getting these like little cuts here and there, these tiny deductions mm-hmm. um, or GOE things that you know, because. You know, a twizzle went out of out of sequence or a person's blade work wasn't quite right or things like that. You see that stuff happen. Mm -hmm. And then Piper and Paul, like in one of their twizzle sequences, Piper has a has a visible bobble. Yeah. Even like Mark, the commentator mentions it. Right. And we watched it in slow mo happen in slow mo. And they they got called fours on that twizzle sequence. But we saw other teams get deducted pretty heavily in places for things that were roughly the same. Right. And that's where as a a fan at home, you're watching like, well, what the hell? Like, why do you give an allowance to some people for it where it almost feels like, well, this is who we want to win. So we went ahead and gave them that thing, but other teams were going to, we're going to bump down even when their quality was obvious. That stuff's irritating. And several times I threw up my hands when the scores came back where I was just like, it does not feel legit. No, I, I agree with you. And Ice Dance is, I mean, it's always the place where the scores sometimes feel like kind of ridiculous because like you said, it's a game of inches. So whenever things move, which is rare in Ice Dance, it's shocking. But even in the commentary, he was talking about like, oh, well, this Rhythm Dance's program score is bigger than what Chalk and Bates got at Skate America. I'm like, Totally different judges, totally different competition. But in ice dance, in any other discipline, it's mentioned, but it's not as relevant. In ice dance, all that stuff is so relevant because it's so who is the team of the moment? Like, who who do we want to move forward? So it very much feels intentional. And this is not taking anything away from the fact that, again, they were the class of the field. Yeah, They absolutely deserve to win. 
but I don't think they needed to win by as much as they did over Lila Fear and Gibson. Yeah, if I'd had my way, Piper and Paul would have been maybe like four points lower and that Fear and Gibson would have been like four points higher. And I'll say that in that I don't really like that Rocky program all that much. <laughs> uh, it's uh, growing on me, even though I don't love the push up. I feel uh, like oh, please leave. I, they left it out the last time. And they brought it back this time. And I'm like, I'm bring it back out. <laughs> so in the preseason, in the challenger season, a lot of talk was about this free skate that's done to Rocky. So and you, yeah, like if you saw in challengers, they leaned really heavy into the boxing element of it. Where yes. like, there were several times in the routine where they would stop Spar. on the ice and do this little sparring routines, which were cute, but it was repetitive. Yeah. And they, they fixed that going, they did. going into Skate Canada. They definitely removed a few sections. They refined things a little bit. They did throw a couple of things back in, like the weird little push up sequence, which is lame. And, uh, but it is a much improved sequence and they are so on fire with the things that they're doing. Yes. I just, I just don't like that material all that much. And to be honest, I can't remember the the uh, the, rhythm, the rhythm dance. dance at all. It's your rhythmics. So I will I will give that a big plus because they do Sweet Dreams and another song that I like, but I cannot remember the name of. And it's really good because, I mean, I feel so ashamed because Annie Lennox is, is it amazing. No, no More I Love You? No, 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 no. no. That, that was just Annie Lennox. Not oh, the right. rhythmics. I'm oh. getting into the music. I'm going to stop. Yeah. But, <laughs> But anyway, I think their rhythm dance is fantastic and really good. Again, I, I kind of wanted some more camp from them. But at the same time, I kind of love that they didn't go that way because Rocky is so camp. You got to have balance somewhere. Right. And they certainly have the best costumes in the rhythm dance. Oof. Other than Madison Chalk. I will put that caveat on that. <laughs> You're not going to beat that one. Never. No. Yeah. I The Rocky program, I'm on the fence. There's a part of me that by the end of it, I'm like, you know, I, I kind of I'm good with it. But, you know, every time, whenever it starts, every competition, I'm just like, oh, no, it's Rocky again. But I'm going to put one pin on that, though. Nobody commits the way that Lila and Lewis do. Oh, like, no. <laughs> as much as the Rocky program might not be my thing, I give them major kudos for just going all in. And the way I think about this is that Piper and Paul and Lila and Lewis both alliterative teams. It just occurred to me, Piper and Paul. And, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, and Lila and Lewis. But that both of those teams, I don't necessarily subjectively love their free programs, but I'm impressed with both of them at the same time. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the, you know, the thing about an artistic sport is that you can have stuff where you can go, I think you're amazing. I don't necessarily want to watch that program over and over and over again, but you might get it to the point where it's, where it's terrific. I mean, we saw that with, with Chalk and Bates last season yeah. where their free program to begin with was kind of aesthetically unpleasing, yeah. even though it was technically fantastic and what they got done by the end of the season and what they did at Worlds was phenomenal. It was beautiful, yeah. They refined it and they, you know, they chipped away at it until it was something great. Both of these programmers are really good out the gate. It's just whether or not it matches your particular vibe, but they both deserve to be where they were at. I think that's actually a good transition into the third place team who won their first Grand Prix medal. Allison Reed and, oh man, another name, Celius Ambrulisivia? No. Uh, (laughs) I like because you're losing the V in there, the um, Ambrulivicus? Sure. Um. The Lithu- Lithuanian team, this team's been around a really long time. Oh, yeah. They are They're the, veterans. I, I, you'd know them if you saw them, if you've watched skating in the last 10 years. Yeah. It's crazy and to me. they're great. They are. It's crazy to me that they have not won a Grand Prix or not medaled at a Grand Prix event before. I didn't realize that until he said it. And that was genuinely shocking because we've been watching them for a long time. And I've never been able to pronounce that man's name. Oh, no. Um, it's, and it's, I'm trying. It's difficult for an American, for sure. <laughs> I kept commenting that they both look like they should have been actors in the Twilight films. Like there's something they do kind of look like they're very know. regal looking. Yes. Yes, exactly. I like, I mean, and I'm no Twilight fan, but if I think about like, especially the third and fourth movie, I feel like you could have stood them like right behind like Lee Pace or something and mm. been like, Oh, there's, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> 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 I said it as a cue for you. Um, but I feel like you could have them in the, you know, in the vampire makeup or in the outfits or whatever. And they'd look Gothic and incredible in it for sure. But they were really, really exciting on ice. They uh, were beautiful. I like their programs a lot. And, uh, and I, yeah, admittedly, I definitely got skeptical whenever they said that the free program was about society's reliance on social media and removal from 
themselves from real human contact. It, it felt very heady, which I, I tend to love heady things. But whenever I hear it for a skating program, I have that like, oh, no. <laughs> but- <laughs> yeah, there's I mean, there's something to be said for the fact that, like, we've seen some other programs that have gone in to have these highfalutin, ethical, moral, philosophical ideas. And sometimes that really sinks a program yeah. under the weight of too much idea. But I actually thought this one was clever. It was. I liked it. Yeah. Even the fact that at the very their la- their ending pose is that they after all of this connection and stuff and whatever. He's standing there with her and she looks away and looks and holds her hand out like she's looking at her phone again. Yeah. It's a really nice touch. And yeah, overall, like, I mean, I, I like the costumes. I like the delivery. I liked their skate of the top three. They might have been who I liked the best, actually. I want to bring up to this is pretty common in a lot of these, you know, Grand Prix series competitions is the competition within the competition. Yeah. yeah. Because we had three American teams, Una Brown and Gage Brown. Uh, Amelia Zingas and Vadim Kolznik and Ava Patton Logan by and all of them are really vying for that third spot on the world team this year so them all being at Skate Canada and showing up really well here and being genuinely pretty damn close in terms of their scores was just a really interesting thing to watch in terms of, okay, who are the international judges going to say we like the best of these three? Because that's going to absolutely matter as the season progresses. And the shakeup there is that the team that performed the best and that the judges seemed to like the most were the Brown siblings. That was genuinely surprising to me. And I really like Una and Gage. I think they're phenomenal skaters. I do feel like they still skate a bit junior in terms of just their material and their presentation just overall. But from Skate America to to Skate Canada, only a week, and you could see how much Skate America had already helped them and really moved the needle on both of their programs. Their speed was better. Their flow was better. Their connection was better. And man, Gage sells the hell out of this stuff. Like he is on. He's ready. He is drama. I like it. I'm like more of this like yeah. from both of you. I mean, I need that to make that emotional connection. And I want to also point out that both of the other teams were amazing and that when it comes time for nationals, Zingas and Kolznik, I mean, it's going to be so tight between them, like because they are phenomenal. They're free program to Beauty and the Beast, which is not a music selection I'm really into <laughs> anymore. Yeah. They change my mind. Mm-hmm. Like it's beautiful. Yes, they they are terrific. They they impressed me a lot too. Those were definitely in a couple of for Zingus and Colsnick and for Una Brown and, and Gage Brown. I, there were places that even as well as they scored, I they got dinged with like lower levels on elements that I didn't understand. Gage got dinged a couple of times for things where they dropped his levels to threes or twos. Mm-hmm. And even as well as they did, you know, they perf- they still landed in the the fourth position, which for them, I think, was a huge deal. I think it was. And it, admittedly, I'm a little surprised that they held it in the free. In the rhythm dance, Zingus and Kolznik had an issue with their twizzles. And they, they have been open about the fact that the twizzles are kind of their nemesis. Yeah. So because, because she she used to be a single skater yes. just uh, two years ago. Right. It's obvious that that's one thing that's going to take some time. And the fact that they're already at the level that they're at after such short time being together is incredible. That said, they had some problems. I mean, even in the long, they had it wasn't as bad, but a little a little sketchy on the on the twizzle. Regardless, the Browns still took it. So it's it's going to be very, very interesting. I do think for Ava Pat and Logan By, they showed up beautifully. They skated really well. But I think it's going to be hard for them to, like, surpass those two teams. I think that this was a pretty definitive, like, it, it's going to be difficult. They might. You never know. But um, in dance, sometimes you do. Yeah. And I just want to give a, a shout out to the 10th place. So you had um, uh, Wang and Liu from China. And um, they definitely uh, lack some of the technical uh, of the other teams. And there's some refinement stuff that's still in the works. But just give them bonus points for just being super hot. (laughs) They are very, very attractive. They are stupidly attractive people. Yeah, they are beautiful people. There's a thing that when we're watching skating, um, and I don't know if I've mentioned on the podcast before, but this is my, I I have this thing that I call the, so somebody walks into Starbucks scale. (laughs) 
<laughs> and my thing is always saying that, like, let's say you're standing in a Starbucks or a cafe of your choice. If you're if you're not big on that, if you're indie cafe, whatever place that you you like to get your coffee at. And a person walks in. It's like what reaction they get. Right. right. And, and I it, think it actually all started with Maddie Hubble. Like it was like if Maddie Hubble walked into your Starbucks and you looked up at her, you'd be a little stupid for a second, especially right. post skating. Yeah. I think she looks better she now. She looks better post-skating. It's yeah. amazing. She's but gorgeous. I always say about like Fournier, Boudre, and Sorensen that like if they walked into your your local coffee shop, you'd be like, that's like the most attractive couple I've ever seen. Please go away. I feel like a troll. Right. <laughs> um, uh, and, and we have seen uh, Wang and Liu before, uh, like last I mean, season. At the Olympics. Yes. So they've been around for a little while, but he used to have kind of stupid hair. Uh, he had, he kind had of the a, mullet he had, look. He had the mullet look that was a little trendy in that moment. But their look this season, everything, it just every time I see them, I'm like, yeah, you are not competitive enough at this particular point to go anywhere near a podium, but you are intimidatingly attractive. Oh, yeah. And the crowd still loves them regardless. So um, Because they're beautiful. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she knows it. Uh, she very much knows <laughs> it. And I don't say that as a diss. I say that as, yes, please bring it. Yeah. I'm so happy you do. Yeah. So, yeah. I think he does, too, actually. Like, I think they're both pretty aware well, he's also, gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's really tall and has, like, you know, chiseled features. And she is small and super pretty and really expressive. And, yeah, that's enough about them being hot. But they are, if you didn't pay attention, do. They're super hot. <laughs> Moving on <laughs> to our last discipline, the men. <laughs> okay, so we mentioned last week, Jackie Wong from uh, Rocker Skating had, has, has used, been using this phrase that we've been seeing take off, which is that the men are going to men or the men are menning. And what that generally means is, is that in the men's competition, you can expect some big meltdowns. You can expect surprises as far as like some people will rise to the occasion and some will completely fall to, apart. To, to put it very directly, shit's going to be messy. Yes. We in our own home refer to it as the shit the bed scale. <laughs> yeah. So I think of it as your performance is, the, is that you make the bed and you have to lay in it afterwards. And <laughs> if you make the bed beautifully and you win, you, you lie in a glorious bed. That's like a hotel bed that was made just for you that you get into and it's comfortable and lovely and clean. And if you blow more than half of the elements that you're getting judged on in it, you have shit the bed. And we definitely saw some beds get soiled um, in here. <laughs> Unfortunately, most notably one of our favorites, Jun Wan Cha, who oh. um, is a remarkable skater he, who's oh. who's uh, <laughs> free program to to the Batman has been unkind to him this season, but we'll come back to him. Let's we, we okay, do we do with everybody. Moment. Yeah, we'll, let's just go down the the line like we have been. Okay, um, so we're gonna start with the winner. Let's start yes, with the good. Let's start with the. Let's winner. start with happy things. So yeah. Yamamoto. Hell yeah! Well done, so yeah. Yamamoto. The Japanese just have the best names, man. Like Sota Yamamoto, right? Like. How great is that? It's a powerful name. Hell yeah, it is. I really like Soto Yamamoto. I, I, I am less excited about him than you, but I do enjoy him. <laughs> Last season, uh, he was very notable for having big jumps that he did fist pumps afterwards. Lots like very, of fist pumps. Very manly fist pumps. And now it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of a meme. Somebody even made a pillow with him on it doing the, the fist pump, pump and oh. gave it to him when he went into the kiss and cry and he held it up and it was hilarious. And I think he got a lot of flack for that. Like he needed to refine his skates and not because he did. He did. He's a great jumper. He's not always the greatest artist on ice, but we have seen work on that this season. Absolutely. These are much more mature and refined programs. Without and fist pumps. Without, I, I didn't see a single no, one from him. No, he, he was, held it in. Yeah, even in the gala, it felt like it was being restrained, and I respect that so I do, too. In general, I, yeah, he came out here, and... Uh, I mean, His he, short was amazing. Like, crisp, clean combination his quads looked gorgeous and fully rotated, which is nice. I believe he fully rotated most of them, now that I'm thinking about it. He just looked prepared. He looked conditioned. He looked calm. It was just a really nice thing to see in the short program. His long program, a little messier, but not bad. On the level of men menning, it was very low. Um, he ended up fourth in the free skate, but because he was so far ahead in the in the short. He was third in the free skate. Third in the free skate. Thank you yeah. for the correction. Mm -hmm. But he was far enough ahead in the short where he still held on to the title. and By like less than a point. Yes, because Kalmura. Soda came out with big 
pretty charismatic, very, he skates up and out. He skates yeah. to the audience in a big way, and he's got a very confident vibe to him. Yes. Um, but one of our other faves from last season is Calmira. And Calmira last season was splitting time between senior and juniors. He won four continents after he had had an abysmal Japanese nationals and got demoted out of nationals and sent to junior nationals. Junior with, Worlds. Or junior, um, yeah. He was sent to Junior Worlds instead of Senior Worlds, but he won Junior Worlds. Definitively. Definitively. He destroyed the competition at Junior Worlds. And he was fantastic at yeah. Four Continents. And we were watching him with interest because he had done really well on the Grand Prix season and stuff too. He is a powerful, kind of wild skater with a very distinct identity and style on the ice. He is not everybody's cup of tea, apparently, because some people like, you know, they want the more classic skater and Cowie's not that guy. Although mm -hmm. he's shown that he's he had a Beauty and the Beast program last year that did show more of that. He's kind getting of there. Refinement. He's, he's, yeah. he's getting more refined. So in this competition, his short program had a couple of little issues and it landed him in fourth. But he won the free skate. Yes. Definitively. With, yeah. He fell on w one triple axel. Everything else was amazing. It was really wonderful to see. And you could tell that he is somebody who he's been very candid about his goals for this year. It really hurt not getting to go to Senior Worlds last year. He wants to make the Grand Prix final. I think he has a very good chance at doing it. And he wanted to win here. Obviously, it didn't happen, but he did win the free. And I think that that's a great statement on his path towards Japanese nationals, towards the Grand Prix final, towards Worlds. I mean, it's important to note that if he had not fallen on that triple axle in the free program, he would have won the he whole would thing. Have won. He, would, yeah. he would have won. It would, it's, it's the difference of one element. Even if he just didn't have that deduction, right? Yeah. If it had been a hand down or something like that, he would have won. So Cow put on a, a, a terrific performance. And the three Japanese men at this competition, him and Soda and Kazuki Tomona, who we'll talk about in a minute, are all like really good friends. And so uh, I love the Japanese team. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're they're such good vibes in general. But those three guys are really good pals. And you can see it with, like in the gala, some of the things they were doing together and the fact that they're all playing poker in the hotel rooms. Like <laughs> it's, it's adorable. And, and then talking about how like it's all good unless Rinka Watanabe shows up because they'll mop. She'll mop the floor with all of them because she's apparently <laughs> really, really good at poker. Um, but yeah, the Japanese team just just has good vibes all the way around. But yeah, Cow is a real threat in this season i think so i think that he is a he's a podium threat for worlds um as long as he continues the upward trajectory and gets clean programs because he's a powerful jumper he's fast as hell and just his abandon like you said he's wild in a lot of his choreography he's reined it in and gotten himself kind of more put together he's organized on the ice if you will but his style is still wild and ha that sense of abandon is sort of what his artistry is and i dig it it's different he looks himself there doesn't feel like he's putting anything on I, I don't know there's a like there's a good authenticity to him and i am excited to see where he goes i think his numbers even as high as they were aren't like in Ilya Malinin at Skate America League because nobody is right now but Ilya Malinin isn't always flawless so Cow is definitely a, a threat. Yeah. And in the gala performance, his gala skate, I think, showed who Cow most wants to be. Which a rock star. He showed incredible intensity. A lot of that kind of reckless freedom that we saw from him a little bit early on, but also a lot of kind of urban dance element stuff that to me harkens to things like there's a dance troupe called The Lab. Um, that I, I kind of see in elements of what he's doing. Um, also, if uh, if you've ever seen, there's a music video for the BTS song On, which is called their like physical manifesto, which is also choreographed by the lab and features that that dance troupe in it. There's elements of that that I see. Um, now, obviously, that's a, a South Korean group. He's Japanese. But that type of vibe in there, that intense physicality in it, is what he was showing off in the gala. I'm here for it. I loved it. I was really, really taken with it. No, he's great. In third, and this is shocking. This is where shit gets weird. This is, the rest of this is genuinely bizarre. So in eighth, after the short program, moves up to third overall, second in the free, Matteo Rizzo. And if you had told me these standings without having watched the competition, I'd be like, oh yeah, Soda, Cow, Mateo. That makes all that makes sense. They're all great. They're all podium threats at any given time. It makes perfect sense. Having watched the competition, 
what the actual hell. And I love Mateo. I think he's charming, charismatic. Yes. I love his short program this year. I think it's choreographed brilliantly. It's so clever. His long doesn't feel as interesting to me, but it was mostly clean. And he, he was very, very strong in it. So I'm thrilled for Mateo to have podiumed here again, like his second bronze medal at Skate Canada in a row. So that's nice. However, I'm shocked by all of the movement. And I think the thing that I can almost read on your face sitting across from me is also there was the guy in fifth place who is Kazakhstan, uh, Mikhail Shaidarov, who had a, in my opinion, better long program than Mateo Rizzo. Yes. So Mikhail is, is the big surprise of all this. And I think we'll, because we're going down the line, we'll get to him. But here's the place where there's two things I kind of want to hit the point on. Last week, when we talked about Skate America, we talked about how uh, Nina Petrokina did exactly the thing that a podium threat but not assured skater can do, which is put on the best performance you can, even if you're not necessarily favored to land on the podium and be ready for the person above you to make a mistake. Yeah. And in that particular instance, when Amber Glenn dropped out of the, the podium range, Nina Petrokina moved up into that bronze position and got the first first Estonian medal on a Grand Prix event ever. She did that so well and we're big fans of Nina. So we were really excited for her in this instance. Again, love Matteo Rizzo. Think he's terrific. And he did that thing where he gave a really competent long program and he set himself up to make that wild jump from eighth place to third to third and onto the podium. The problem I have is that I don't think that was the right scoring because I don't think he deserved quite as high a score as he did on that free program. And I absolutely think that Mikhail uh, Shadorova Shadorov, I don't think the Kazakhstan skater <laughs> Mikhail, got our friend. Yeah, Mikhail. I don't think that he was scored high enough. I agree with um, that. And his coach is Olympic champion from 1994, Alexei Ermanov. And you could tell his coach did not agree. He looked genuinely stunned and I agreed with that. I, I understand that he's not as refined of a skater as Matteo Rizzo at all. He's just not. But he was clean. And what he did warranted a higher score. It was confusing. Yeah. So I know we, we've danced from third to fifth, which means that we're skipping over Kazuki Tomono. But we'll go back to him in a second here. So the thing I want to say about the Kazakhstan skater, Mikhail, when he first came out for the short program, he's immediately recognizable as doing like a Matrix program. Yes. And I saw it and I was like, uh, I don't know. And I'm somebody who saw the Matrix eight times in the theater when it came out back in 1998, 99. Uh, I, you know, I loved it and I love the music from it. And, and I was immediately like, OK, he's got to be doing Club to Death, which he was. But he was doing a remix of it that I hadn't heard before and that I thought was a really interesting one. And by the end of it, I was really impressed. Mm -hmm. I liked that program a lot, way, way more than I expected to. And perhaps because my expectations were very low and there had been a lot of really messy men's programs beforehand. But I was like, man, that's pretty cool. When he came out for the free skate again, I really wasn't expecting all that much. I didn't know this guy. I wasn't really familiar with him. And, you know, he came out again with kind of this kind of wacky outfit with this weird collar on it and it looks like he was on fire or something like I was like, is this about hell? What is this? What's going on here? <laughs> but he, like you said, he skated a clean, really well constructed, well delivered program, not the greatest artistry on the planet. Maybe not all of the technical that you need to be like on the upper echelon of things. But at the end of the day, I was like, that's one of the better combos of skates in this entire competition. Yes. And when it came time to get his score, the crowds lit up for him. Like he's done a really good job. I think he caught everybody surprise by surprise. And you, what you always hate to see is the face of the skater and the coach see their faces fall when the score comes in and it isn't where anybody thinks it should be. Right. To be fair, I have not looked at all of the judges individually to see exactly where their deductions were, if there were a lot of under rotations. So it's possible. But I still feel like having watched Mateo and him as a Mateo fan, I would still have picked Mikhail in this particular setting because I do feel like in both programs, he earned the slot and got lower scores than were deserved. Yeah. But I do want to step us back and sure. go back to Kazuki Tomono, who had probably, if not definitely, my favorite short program of anyone at this competition because it's so it's just so good. 
<laughs> he he wasn't perfect. He he was flawed, but he came in third in the short program. But that choreography on him just looks divine. I am so happy with it. And Kazuki is so charismatic. He's so big. He's just this huge personality in this small Japanese man's body. And it's beautiful to watch on ice and his edge work and his quality is there. And then he goes into his free and I felt nothing. And it makes me so sad because not only was it flawed enough to drop him out of the medals, but also watching that program, I'm worried because I feel like Kazuki Timono is that guy who's always the sub the drop him in on the Japanese world team if somebody else drops out. But with the Japanese field being so deep with Shoma and Yuma and a laundry list of other Japanese men vying for three world spots, watching his long program here made me really worried. I'm like, okay, is this the time where Kazuki Tomono gets passed by? When I think about Kazuki, I think about like last season, he had these these really wonderful, whimsical programs that he executed beautifully. But you never felt like he had the maturity at the time to claim those top spots, especially when, you know, you did have a Shoma Uno at the top of the of the Japanese men. And this season, these new programs, I think, are designed to illustrate a more mature, growing artist uh, with him. But yeah, that free skate, it was just lacking that certain je ne sais quoi Mm -hmm. um, uh, to make it really compelling. And you could just see. You know, when you talk about those death by a thousand cuts, there was just enough of these little problems that by the time he got done, everybody in there was like, oh, you just lost the podium. Yeah, you, for sure. It just slipped away. And it was obvious. And it's less than a point between Matteo Rizzo and uh, Kazuki Tomono. But again, some really tight spots in this. Very tight. But at the same time, it was, it def- was deserved. It was deserved. Yeah. And I, I hate that because I am a huge fan of his. So that's why I think it hurt because... Again, I loved his short program. It gave me hope. And then his long program, beyond just the messiness of the program itself, the composition of the material makes me a little worried. I don't know that it's right on him, but I hope I'm wrong. I want to be wrong. I think it's correctable. And it could have just been not his day in that moment and he didn't find himself in it. But yeah, I hope so. For for such a great skater, um, hopefully it comes together there. But now we have to talk about Jun Wan. Uh, Junwan Cha, last year, I mean, this guy's been around for a while. Um, he's a terrific skater. He's a terrific, terrific art, artistic skater. If you are at all tapped into the ice skating world, you know he is maybe the definitive current fan favorite other than maybe Ilya. Junwan has a huge international fan base. Um, he's a rock star at home in South Korea. He, he looks like a K-pop idol. Yeah. I mean, like his best friend is a K-pop idol, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who also used to be a skater, you know. And they have performed together on variety shows. They're doing like dance stuff together. And Jun Wah typically actually looks better than the other, than this K-pop idol friend does. <laughs> um, he is an impressive artistic force. And last season, we saw him kind of finally blooming into that place everybody's wanted to see for a long time where things would just come together. Yes, he really felt like he was coming into his own finally and won the silver medal at Worlds. Yeah. And Very well deserved. Looked incredible there. Looked incredible at, at World Team Trophy. His uh, James Bond free skate. So cool. So, so cool. well executed. Best quad Cow in the business. He is the best quad Cow in the business. He also, of all things, has probably the second best Ina Bauer in the entire business. It's incorrect. And it would be at any other time, it would be the best you've ever seen, except for Yellen Kim exists. Yeah. And her Ina Bauer is a thing of glory. But Jun Wan going into this, you fully expected him to end up on the podium. 100%. He could have easily been the top person at this event. A lot of people referred to him as the clear frontrunner for it. And that's fair. But he was absolutely a medal like expectation. Right. The problem, if we're not looking at just last season, but if we're looking at the challengers earlier in this season, a couple of issues here. One Jun Wan last year was working with Brian Orser in Canada and having tremendous success. But in the off season, for a number of reasons, he wanted to just go back to South Korea, be at home, work with coaches there and be able to focus on his time and family like back home. And also he wanted to bring more technical like he wanted to focus more on, you know, adding more jumps. Right. Yeah. In order to be more and more competitive for higher levels in high level competition. Yeah. But what we saw instead in the Challenger series was a Junwan who did not look conditioned. No. Whose jumps were not in good shape. No. 
And in particular, of all things, in this Batman uh, free skate, which the music is great for and the choreography is really strong for, in the, the Challenger series, he couldn't land his triple axles. He kept popping them. Yeah. And so he blew several Challenger series. Uh, and he, yeah, I mean, it was just, he was having a lot of messy skates. It wasn't just the axles, but yes, those in one particular competition, he blew both of them and just popped them entirely. It's more than that. To your point, I feel like it's the conditioning overall. And just watching him on the ice, he does not look like the same skater. No. It's frustrating. Yeah. And I'm sure he's insanely frustrated. Oh, absolutely. Um, but his short program, he was in the second spot. Yeah, he, it was really he had strong. a fall, but yeah. he's also added a second quad to his short program to, again, level up. I believe that was counted as fully rotated, even though he fell. So while it was a deduction, it still was his program overall was still good enough to keep him in the second spot. But his long program might be the most disastrous long program I've seen from a man at his level in years. Yeah. So he comes out and starts off that Batman routine and he goes into the quad sal, which again, his moneymaker, he's the best in the world at it. His quad sal is just absolutely gorgeous. And not only does he fall, but he falls and slides all the way into the boards and then has a stiff stand up where he looks, it, con- he looks utterly broken and confused for a moment. It would like, look like it hurts. Right. It, yeah. That was definitely the, the, the stiff rise from something that was very painful and his next jump, he fell and went into the boards. Right. And uh, I just, it wasn't enough time to even recover. And so from there on out, you have a program that is off its access the the whole time. Right. He and went, he fell again. He popped things. He, it was just disastrous. And when it ended, you could see how defeated he was and just emotionally. Like he held it together and was a professional in the kiss and cry but man, that's one of those times where you have to just go home and completely regroup and be like, what the hell was that? Yeah, I, I mean, I got to give him huge ups just for getting his sense of humor back in the yeah. kiss and cry, joking around with his coach and and showing good humor. I mean, he's a clear professional. He's good people. Yeah, but he went from second to ninth because yeah. he was literally the 11th free skate in score. And it, like you said, it was of a real competitive skater, maybe the worst meltdown. I mean, I've definitely seen the last 10 years. I can't yeah, think of it, anything. It was, was terrible. And I say that with love because I'm like, I want June Juan on the podium again at Worlds. Yeah. Like he is at a level of skater that this is upsetting. It makes me think of when Nathan Chen at Skate America, the year, like the Skate America before his Olympic victory, he flubbed a couple of things and landed in third and everyone's like oh my god and <laughs> like the world is ending and nathan chen has 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 failed us and like still came in third y'all and he was still pretty darn strong he just made a couple of mistakes and then the next week he went to skate canada and demolished the competition and of course went on to win his olympic gold medal yeah but looking at like somebody at his level just messing up a bit uh-huh not a meltdown. I, that's the last time I can remember people reacting the way they are now. But this is far worse than that. This is the kind of disaster on ice that requires a recalibration. I think that when you see something like this happen, a few falls are a fluke. Getting hurt on the ice will change things dramatically. But in general, like people have a bad skate, but they can come back from it. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of skate that has to make everybody stop and go, oh, no, there's real problems here. Because you, to your point earlier, he, this isn't like one competition. The whole Challenger series, he's been having problems. So this was just an extension and a more severe version of it. Right. We were hoping by the time that he got to the Grand Prix that he would have fixed the problems in Challenger and would have repaired this free skate so that uh, that he was he remained competitive for the podium. Instead, he did much worse than we'd seen previously. I'm of the sentiment that I saw echoed online, um, which is that they need to send his ass back to Canada, right back to Orser, and let Orser do some fixing and figure out what's gone on, why why his conditioning, why he looks so tired on the ice, why you know what's going on here. You know, barring there being some other kind of health issue we don't know about or something when God help, like that's not the case. Oh, my gosh. But but also or there's a personality issue or like conflict between him and Orser, which I have not heard anything about. So that's not me starting a rumor. It's purely like there might be additional context. 
But I agree. It's like my instinct, if I were him, would be, okay, I won the world silver medal last year and was consistently getting better all the time when I was with Orser. I step away from him and I'm falling apart. That's a pretty clear signal. There's definitely something not working in what he's doing now. And if they want to see him be competitive by the time we get to the Grand Prix final and to Worlds, they got to fix that right now or this season's going down the toilet. If they can do it at home, that's wonderful. I want I want nothing more than people to be happy. But yeah, when I was watching it last night, I'm like, oh, my God, I hope he pulls out of his next Grand Prix and just spends the rest of the fall regrouping redo whatever is not happening in that program, you know, rework what's not working because this doesn't feel like a, you go to the next competition and shrug it off. This is bad. Yeah. Um, I don't want to end the, the episode no. <laughs> on such a downer note with all this. So I do want to just circle around to the fact that, um, that overall there were parts of this competition that were definitely lackluster in the sense that a lot of the rest of the men were not very strong, but we're seeing that across the board. There's a lot of yeah. guys that are building towards something more and just aren't quite there yet. And certainly, you know, some of the pairs are not quite competitive. Obviously, you know, the top of the podium was spectacular, but overall that discipline needs some help. But I thought the women's competition was terrific. It was. There was lots and lots of good stuff in there. Ice Dance was really good, like lots and lots of great performances there. And those guys at the top of the podium in the men's competition, I thought were thrilling and super fun. Are they quite going to hold up to an Ilya Malinin or the eventual like return of Shoma of Uno? Shoma. Maybe not yet, but, you know, ice is slippery and it all depends on the day. You know what's happening when you're there. Anything can happen. But, um, but I'm now just thinking about King Shoma. Yeah, I can't I mean, wait to see him. Yeah, the short King Shoma, um, <laughs> it, you know, we have not seen him debut yet this season. Um, and so hopefully we'll see that here shortly. I can't wait. Uh, but he, of course, you know, was mighty last year and I expect nothing but spectacular skates from I him this one. So. But next week we have the France uh, Grand Prix. <laughs> I love the face uh, Adrian is making at me, Rachel. I was like, I don't know where I have no it is. idea. It only occurred to me just now. <laughs> I have no idea what what the next skate is. The next skate, will, I'm I'm very excited, is going to be the first Grand Prix pre appearance of Yuma Kagiyama. Oh, hell yeah. So I'm ready. Yuma Kagiyama had to sit out last season because of injury. Um, he is a powerful competitor. Some of the best jumps. In, Reigning in the... Olympic silver medalist. Yeah. So um, having him uh, come back, we've seen a little bit of him in the in the Challenger series. He's been and getting his feet under him. Yeah, he's still, he's not quite to the level of where he was at before. But man, when his jumps land, they are spectacular. I can't wait. Yeah. So, yeah, look forward to that. I mean, there's still we're one third of the way through the Grand Prix season now. Yep. Uh, with those these first two events. So and they're already starting to really show some uh, some interesting matchups. Right. Yeah. And this is the thing that's fun in this is that, like, you can have a lot of clear favorites going into this stuff. But by no means does that mean that how it shakes out at the end will look anything like we expected to at the beginning. Yeah, I don't know, I'm stoked. I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see where the season goes from here. And with that, I believe it is time for us to bid everyone adieu. Okay, so uh, Scoreography exists online at scoreography.show. You can follow us as at Scoreography on Instagram, on threads, as at Scoreography.show on, uh, on Blue Sky. Uh, we still exist on Twitter or whatever it's called these days, but uh, that is only just until name only that's just there until uh, like the rest of uh, skating fans find their way to somewhere else like where do you live online tell us because we want to we'll know there. If, yeah even, even if it's facebook which ugh, please i mean please tell me that's not where it's at it like might it might be but um but really instagram and threads uh, and blue sky are where we live right now so um keep up with us on the social places there um we didn't live tweet this particular event because it's just a lot of work and this week was a little too chaotic for us so we're kind of catching up on things, not always in real time. We'll try to do it for some of the other events as we go along. But anyway, I hope you're as excited about the, the rest of the skating season as we are. And so for choreography, I'm Adrian Buskey. And I'm Wendy Buskey. And we'll catch you next time. Bye.